Welcome to You and Your Pets. I'm Jim Horton. We're here with our resident expert, Dr. Ernest Rogers of the Maplewood Animal Hospital, and we deal with a wide range of issues related to pets. So, and we have a special guest tonight, so I'm going to ask Dr. Rogers, would you kindly introduce him? Thank you, Mr. Horton. Tonight, we're lucky enough to have Dr. Kenneth Pierce, an ophthalmologist from Garden State Veterinary Specialists, and Dr. Pierce actually did he actually comes from Narlands, <laughs> and uh, we had an interesting conversation before the show, and uh, did his uh, veterinary medicine in Louisiana, and then did some residencies in ophthalmology. So uh, I have referred to you, I think, at least once, and uh, Dr. Pierce is what the general practitioner calls a backup. Uh, when we can't handle it or when we get over our heads in an ophthalmological case, we'll refer to Dr. Pierce. Okay. So what was your training in veterinary medicine that you became an ophthalmologist? How did, how did that work? How did that flow? Yeah, so my training began with, uh, after undergraduate uh, school at Tuskegee University, I went to Louisiana State University, where I'm a uh, New Orleans native, uh, for veterinary medicine, which is the, kind of the equivalent to medical school for physicians. Uh, after four years of education there, then uh, did a, two internships. One was a rotating small animal medicine and surgery internship at the University of Tennessee, and then uh, spent a subsequent year in Southern California uh, with a research facility, uh, as well as with a specialty ophthalmology practice called Eye Care for Animals in Southern California. Uh, and then from there, uh, went on and did a residency in ophthalmology. Um, the majority of ophthalmology residencies are a three-year commitment, uh, whereas there are some that do require a four-year uh, training, which gives an additional year of kind of basic science training for an additional degree. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we should make it clear that the residency is above and beyond veterinary medicine. Correct. The four-year program gives general medicine surgery. It includes ophthalmology, anesthesiology, and all the other sciences, but the, train, the education that Dr. Pierce got as an ophthalmologist is well above and beyond what I got when I was in medical school. Okay, why did you choose ophthalmology? So that's the, the one of the best things I like about uh, ophthalmology is that it combines medicine and surgery, as well as I'm not limited to just particular dogs and cats. I can look at any animal and go anywhere and do it uh, as I see fit. So it's, uh, it keeps the variety going there. And so what kind of exotics have you uh, dealt with so uh, the exotics that I have uh, dealt with range from uh, pocket pets, from uh, gerbils. gerbils to guinea pigs to ferrets to uh, as large as elephants, lions, tigers, no snow kidding. leopards. Yeah. You have done yeah. that. Yeah. So were you affiliated with a zoo or something? Yeah, the zoo in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, when I was uh, uh, during vet school as well as after my residency training, went uh, spent a year and a half at faculty at Louisiana State University, uh, so teaching there. And then during my four years of residency at Michigan State University, um, we worked a lot with the zoo right there in uh, Lansing, Michigan. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Yeah. So when you were doing the elephants, I guess you used a ladder? Uh, no, they actually <laughs> trained the elephant to kind of tuck his head down <laughs> a little bit there. So uh, they were well trained. It, it worked out pretty good. What interests have you pursued in ophthalmology? Do you have an area of concentration within the concentration? Yeah, so uh, during my residency training, um, my, I pursued a master's degree uh, and got a master's degree. Uh, and part of my research was associated with uh, retinal degenerative disease uh, called progressive retinal atrophy, or PRA. It's very similar to the condition called retinitis pigmentosa in people. And so uh, part of my research was looking at a, a drug that potentially may have had some uh, implications in affecting dogs that might be at risk for this disease, but that drug didn't. Um, but so, so my field or my area that I, I like a lot is retinal disease there. But uh, How does that relate to macular degeneration? So macular mm. uh, degeneration itself is just a little bit different as far as overall the makeup of the, the pathology of the eye itself right. as far as anatomy compared to the dog okay. and people we have a general a central area where 
a lot of our vision, especially depth perception, comes from. Whereas in dogs, they don't have that uh, depression within the retina. They just have a, a higher concentration of the cells there. And that's very similar to what we have, but um, the condition of progressive retinal atrophy mainly affects the general population of photoreceptors within the retina right. or, or the, basically the general retina, whereas macular degeneration mainly focuses on that, that main Fo area yeah, yeah. that gives us uh, um, acute our, vision. Yeah, acute vision, exactly. Yeah. So it's interesting because I'm sure some of our some of our people watching today are very familiar with macular degeneration and mm -hmm. a lot of the other diseases we've talked about, but I want people to understand that uh, Dr. Pierce is as much an ophthalmologist as the physician who's an ophthalmologist, that the diseases he treats are just as complicated, just as intensive, and require the same amount of education that the general ophthalmologist in a, in a general practice for a physician would need. Okay. What are the basics of a canine and feline ophthalmological, ophthalmological uh, <laughs> I'll get that, I'll get that, I really will, ophthalmological uh, examination? Yeah, so the kind of what you can expect if you brought uh, your pet to me to, for examination would be, first of, all, first of all, a general assessment of is your pet visual or not, how well it's uh, navigating around the room or down the hallway as you bring your animal in, a general, as well as a general assessment of do things when you look at his eyes or her eyes as well as your animal's face. Do things look symmetrical or are totally different there? Um, do, you then, use, do you use an eye chart? I find an eye chart <laughs> very useful. <laughs> if, if they would speak, you know. <laughs> um, and then after that, we just take it to the next level with basically getting some baseline information from your animal. How well they're producing tears. What is the pressure within the eye if, if it's high or too low? As well as if there appears to be any scratch. Uh, to the surface of the eye anywhere. And then after that, just like you, when you go to your ophthalmologist and have your eyes dilated to make sure they look at the back of the eye, we do the same thing. We'll dilate your animal's eyes and then get an a overall view of uh, the eye itself. Look at it with some magnification, see if there's any subtle problems there that need to be addressed and taken care of. And How do you actually work with an animal in that case? Do you give it a sedative before you start or? So only if they're bad. <laughs> <laughs> the, the vast majority of animals, uh, probably like 90% of them, we do uh, with them awake. We sit them on a table. Um, and mainly they just require a little restraint because not every animal is used to basically being held down to have their eyes examined, you know, they're not held that way at home, right, so right. it's kind of like uh, trying to give a toddler a medication, you mm -hmm. know, you, you can't tell them the whole still because they don't understand. So uh, only the ones that are either scared or are fractious or trying to bite or things like that do we need to give them a sedative to do an exam. With. Do you use a muzzle when you're examining? Yeah. So <laughs> we use a lot of muzzles when I'm... When yeah. my face is that close to their biting end, I, I prefer to use a muzzle when I'm exactly. looking at their eyes. Yeah, so if, they, if there's a little suspicion that they're scared, they might bite or something like that, then we do uh, put a muzzle on them because my face is like right here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> next to him. So. <laughs> and I think Dr. Pierce is being a little bit modest because when he's looking at the eye, he's also looking at the whites of the eye to see, oh, are they yellow? Could there be liver disease? Yeah. Is there something else going on? Are they injected or red? And we'll see that in some of the diseases we'll talk later. Yeah. Uh, and he looks at the cornea to see it. The glassy part of the eye, the cornea, is very indicative of what's going on in the dog. And I think they say the eye is the soul to the body. And I think that's why ophthalmology has always fascinated me. There's so much you can tell by looking in the eye. Exactly. So then when you start looking, you do your basic exam, and then you start looking inside. What are you looking for when you're looking inside the eye? So it, uh, any abnormality that, you know, is, is not the normal there. Our eye, <clears throat> excuse me, animals' eyes are similar to ours. There's a lot of variation definitely across species there, but a lot of the same basic structure should all uh, be the same. So if there is something going on, say with your cornea or with your lens there, I'll be able to see that and know that that's obviously not normal, and then depending on what pattern it has, how it looks, 
where it's located, what else is going on within the eye associated with it can help uh, narrow down the answer as far as what we're dealing with and then what needs to be done from there. What are some of the instruments that you use to do this? For example, getting the pressure of the eye, do you use still use a mechanical instrument or do you use a... Uh... Shiat's tonometer. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's been used in... 20 years? Yeah, no, it's the Shiats is a pretty old archaic advice, but a device, excuse me, but it uh, it's still very useful, especially if your practice still has it there. Um, a Shiats the, tonometer is basically a, like a pair of pliers you ha hold in your hand that has a little pendulum, not a pendulum, a little um, protrusion at the bottom, and you put that on the eye, and depending on the weights you have, it'll give you a measurement of the pressure in the eye. It's very difficult to use. <laughs> uh, but now we have uh, a couple of different instruments. One is a, what's called a tonal pin, and it actually looks like a pin. It has a, about a millimeter in diameter tip on it, and what it does is basically measures the force that's required to just slightly indent the cornea. And based on, if you think of the eye, kind of like a pressurized balloon, it has mm -hmm. a certain amount of force, so it's only so much you can actually indent it. And obviously the higher the pressure, the harder it is to indent and vice versa. So that's one option. And then uh, another one is a, an instrument called a tonal bed where it actually is a rebound tonometer. Basically it's a small little probe that gets uh, projected towards the eye, it bounces off the cornea, and then the vibrations within the instrument, it records them and depending on those vibrations, it actually gives a reading. It's almost similar to kind of the puff of air test that you get when you have your uh, eye pressure test by your ophthalmologist, but just uh, it's a little different. And you use um, uh, a local anesthetic when you're doing that. Exactly, exactly. So, so it's uh, not painful for the animal. Exactly. The eye is anesthetized, they don't feel anything. If anything, they just, they see it, but it does, it's not painful for them. Mm -hmm. How do people get their pets to you for treatment? Yeah, that's a very good question. So. Definitely if there's ever a eye problem that, or any problem as far as the face or anything like that, the best uh, place to start is with your general practitioner or your local veterinarian and have them assess them first. And then depending on what's going on with the eye, then your veterinarian will refer the, your, your pet or refer you to me, come see me. Uh, so we're usually the second tier as far as treatment and, and you know assessment and getting things taken care of. So your, your general practitioner is usually the first line of defense to get it done. How busy are you? Is it easy to get an appointment with you? Yeah, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's uh, <laughs> depending on the day, it's, it's relatively <laughs> easy. Uh, I mean, I, I am busy. We're usually pretty uh, booked out as far as usually a couple days to weeks ahead. But um, as far as if it is an emergency case, we can you know, we shuttle those in and we, we can work with you as well as your veterinarian to get uh, your animals seen relatively quickly. Um, but it doesn't take much to get a, a appointment. Right. Okay. And usually when we're panicking, we call Dr. Pierce and he does our job. He gets <laughs> us in. Okay, well, we're going to have to take a break and then we're going, after the break, we're going to get into specific eye diseases. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, that should be interesting. Uh, the pictures are a little bit stomach churning, but I think we're fine. <laughs> this is you and your pets. I'm Jim Horton. We'll be right back. Television is a powerful and influential medium that allows different groups the opportunity to produce programming that directly affects their own communities. Public, educational, and government access channels ensure that all people, regardless of race, age, gender, disability, religion, or economic status, have access to local government information and the use of a public communication forum. Make sure everyone has a voice. Support your local PEG channels. We're back with you and your pets, and we're discussing eye diseases, and from this point on, we'll discuss specific diseases. And Dr. Rogers, would you take over with our guests, please? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Dr. Pierce and I have had a chance to uh, discuss these, uh, some of these diseases, and I've tried to put them in groups. Now, these are pictures that I have, and Dr. Pierce is not familiar with them, but I, as we went through them, he knew everything. So. Uh, I'm pleased to say that I, the groups I've tried to put them in 
are groups that owners would see similar symptoms, but when they came to me, I might see different diseases. So the first one is with cats. Mm -hmm. And we often see cats with discharge in their eye mm -hmm. or with a bulbous, what's called a chemotic conjunctiva or a very thickened um, sort of balloon-like yeah, swollen, conjunctiva, yeah. swollen conjunctiva with a, often a lot of discharge. Some of it is liquid and some of it is going to be uh, mucoid. And so there are three diseases that I see regularly, and I'm sure Dr. Pierce can talk about 10, but the three diseases I see regularly that come in with cats is this one here, which is a, a Khaleesi virus, which is a virus that affects the eyes. Herpes virus that also affects the eyes. And then a bacterial infection, uh, feline uh, viral rhinotracheitis, uh, or feline rhinotracheitis. And these three that I see, uh, would you like to discuss them? And Yeah, so probably we'll, we'll uh, go, go back? back to the herpes one, because herpes is usually probably the more common uh, that we see. So herpes virus is one that uh, young kittens are mainly exposed to from their uh, mother, usually. Um, or they could be exposed to from other cats. So it's one viral disease that is contagious from cat to cat, not from cat to human or anything like that. Um, and it is one that goes dormant or goes quiet in the body after they had their initial exposure. So you can have a kitten that might have had an infection when they were very young and then for the rest of their life until they're older, until they're stressed or something like that. Or immune will the deficiency. Virus, exactly, or if they're immune deficient, will the virus come back and exhibit signs there? Um, especially when they're young, and like you mentioned with the Khaleesi virus and the rhinotracheitis virus, they're all uh, exposed to all these viral antigens or viral particles uh, when their immune system is, is deficient. So a lot of these viruses can cause very similar signs. The herpes virus itself will affect the uh, lining of the inside of the nose as well as the lining of the eyelids, the cornea itself, as well as potentially uh, the, the conjunctiva. And usually creates ulcers of those areas, so you have corneal ulcers, uh, which will look when your veterinarian t puts a little green dye on the cornea eye. On the eye, it'll have little green lines or right. circles or whatever on the cornea. Uh, but it can be so severe that they actually have their lids as well as their nose looks kind of ulcerated. Then the feline rhinotracheitis uh, virus or, or uh, infection there is when they get a little, they may have had a little bit of herpes or they may have had just that uh, disease itself and they get a bacterial infection on top of that so it affects more of their respiratory tract. They get uh, discharge coming from the nose a fair bit. A little bit of discharge from the eyes because the eyes are also inflamed as well but we don't get as much of the ulcers that for example, herpes will give us. Right. And Khaleesi virus is kind of the, almost similar to the uh, rhinotracheitis virus, except for the fact that now they have ulcers in their mouth as well, and not necessarily uh, the ulcers on the eye, on the cornea. They'll still get the conjunctiva that's all swollen and red and- The conjunctiva and being the pink area around the white area on the eye. Exactly, exactly. So that'll be all swollen and inflamed, right. but potentially not as uh, uh, ulcerated like, right. like we get with herpes. So how do you treat these? So yeah, a lot of them, and especially for example, using herpes as the, the main example, the virus itself after a period of time will run its course and then it'll the stop. Severe. As long as the uh, animal is not severely immunocompromised or it's not on drugs that suppresses immune response there. So uh, once it's run its course, we hopefully can let the virus do its business, treat the secondary bacterial infections and the other symptoms, treat the inflammation, and then they resolve. Right. Sometimes they do require, especially the ones that have a respiratory infection, or antibiotics right. orally to get rid of that infection as well. But a lot of them is just topical medications for no, both no of the No mechanical eye and nose. intervention at all then? Usually not. Usually. Okay, and and we also find that there's uh, anecdotal evidence that something like lysine, 
lysine, the amino acid lysine will help with herpes and we have a certain number of drugs we can use for Khaleesi virus as a support but it won't cure it and then with rhinotracheitis I find that uh, it, it tends to respond very well to antibiotics. Yeah. But the reason why I put these three together is the average person out here in Maplewood, South Orange are going to pick up a kitten and see these kind of things and not know what it is, but it could be one of these three. Could be very easily treated by your veterinarian with just antibiotics, which is what he's going to start with, or it might take more exhaustive treatment. So I just want people to understand when you pick up a kitten that has a problem, it's not always going to be cleared up in the first visit. Yeah. And then we have here, this is another one. So this, <laughs> yeah. so this is a cherry eye in a uh, probably a young dog there. A poodle, I think. And, and cherry eye is um, prolapse of a gland of the third eyelid. So when we look at our eyes, we have an upper and lower eyelid, whereas animals, mainly dogs and cats, but some other uh, species as well, have a third eyelid that sits down in the corner of their eye by their nose, and it functions to kind of spread the tears and protect the eye. Like a windshield wiper. Exactly. So at the bottom of that third eyelid, there's a gland there that normally has a connection down behind the bone uh, on the eye, below the eye itself. Um, and it usually sits there, but sometimes that connection is not as sturdy as it should be, and it'll come up. And breeds that we see that very commonly in is like English Bulldogs. They're probably... Cocker like the, Spaniels. And Cocker Spaniels. Poodles. They're, <laughs> they're notorious for it. So it's definitely cosmetically displeasing. It will get very inflamed, so you'll see that over time that pink tissue become very, very red. It'll have discharge as well as a little tearing from, them, from the eye. Usually your pet is not terribly uncomfortable with it, um, but it can lead to long-term problems uh, mainly dryness over time right. of the eye itself. So usually that is treated by a surgical intervention to um, replace the gland, put it back in its normal position um, and keep it there and that way it can still function appropriately and lubricate right. the eye like it right. should. Because it has lubricating properties in it. Yeah. And then we move on to the big elephant or gorilla in the room, <laughs> glaucoma. And this I'm sure Dr. Pierce would speak on um, as an emergency situation that dogs present themselves and what are the signs that an owner might see initially when an animal is starting with glaucoma initially? Yeah. So this is, a, this is a very good one and it's definitely an emergency. The problem with this is sometimes the signs can be very, very vague. So glaucoma, uh, again we talked about the eye being a pressurized balloon. So when the pressure is too high within the eye, that's glaucoma and the pressure being so high in the eye is actually painful, it's uncomfortable. But not overtly painful like you broke a bone, painful kind of like you have a constant headache, a constant migraine. So if you think about yourself, when you have a headache, you want to kind of sleep a little bit more, you want to be a little bit less active. So typically dogs, as well as cats, will be a little bit subdued. Uh, they may not eat as much of their normal meal, Sometimes they, they're just a little less active altogether. But with the eye itself, what you'll see is they're squinting, they're holding their eye closed. Sometimes they'll be head shy, they'll duck away from you when you try to touch or scratch their head on that side. They'll rub their eye on the carpet, on the furniture. The eyes will be nice, the whites of the eye will be all red. As you can see here. And as well as the front of the eye, the cornea is gonna be nice and cloudy blue. It's gonna be hazy is gonna be much cloudier than the other eye. Sometimes, in the vast majority of time, glaucoma just affects one eye first, and then it could affect the other eye, but it's uh, not uncommon for it to affect both eyes at the same time. So if we see these kind of symptoms, you'd recommend that the dog be brought immediately to the veterinarian? Correct. And in my experience, these can go from okay to serious disease in a matter of hours, if not days. Correct, correct. This is definitely a disease that you do not want to wait on uh, as far as taking your animal to your veterinarian because of the fact that glaucoma can permanently blind your animal. And there's certain breeds of dogs that can tolerate a high pressure a little bit better than others. And the, the pressure spike that they get sometimes can be very, very bad. For example, like Basset Hounds are a breed that can get a really high pressure spike and can permanently blind them just with that one pressure spike. Right. So how do you treat it? So the, 
uh, first we begin with medications to try to reduce the pressure in the eye. Glaucoma medications, just like the mm -hmm. same ones, that a human that would have uh, glaucoma there. Uh, and then depending on the visual status of the eye, once we get the pressure down initially, uh, there's surgical procedures that we can do to actually uh, permanently turn down the amount of fluid that's produced in the eye, as well as shunt some of the fluid from inside the eye out to a different location so that the eye now has an escape route right. to get that fluid out. Right. Sort okay. of like a canal. Exactly. So then we have, I think we're going to, this is going to be our last case to okay. talk about. <laughs> um, we talked about how when you have cherry eye, if that's not properly addressed, sometimes you end up with dry eye or what we call in the business keratitis sica. And so it's KCS and I think this is an example of keratitis sica and the, the specific points of this that are yeah. important for so our this, owners? This is classic. The main thing that you'll see with an animal with dry or KCS or, is discharge. So your animal never had discharge before coming from the eye and discharge is kind of that yellow green material that's constantly coming Thick, from the eye. Thick mucoid. Exactly. So that is going to be usually the first thing that comes and then the eye is slightly good. The whites of the eye will become red because the eye is constantly dry now. There may be a little bit of irritation so occasionally your, you might notice your pet squint here and there, but relatively they keep the eye open. And then if it gets so bad and it's been going on for so long, it can actually be turned into a blinding disease where they put in a bunch of blood vessels in the cornea as well as a lot of pigment in that cornea. And that pigment is kind of like mud on your windshield that you can't see through. So dry eye, not treated, can actually, again, blind your animal which is unfortunate. Is it an emergency or is it just? So it's not, as, it's not an emergency like glaucoma there, but it's definitely something that you don't want to just let fall by the wayside. And that's something that you also should know that it is a treatable disease, it's not a curable disease. So just like if you had dry eye, that's something that you'd have to, you know, keep your eye lubricated long term. Same thing for your pet. Your pet. Right. So we've seen four or five diseases here, but in general, because it's about time, we're going to have to start wrapping up in a couple of seconds. What would you tell owners to look for in their pet in 30 seconds or so yeah. uh, that would make them more aware of the eyes and, and make it easier for me to do my job when they come in to see me? Correct. So the main thing to look out for is any increase in redness to the eyes, any squinting that your animal hasn't done in the past, as well as any form of discharge from the eye itself, whether it's just clear tears that are coming out more frequently or the yellow, green, or, or mucus, that gray, white mucus that's constantly coming from the eye. And then obviously, lastly, it's gonna be if there is a, a change in vision, right? If all of a sudden your animal's not seeing, then you need to get them in right away to see what's going on. Okay, we've run out of time. I'm very sorry. It was delightful to have you on board. <laughs> we want to thank you, Dr. Pierce. This has been You and Your Pets. I'm Jim Horton with Dr. Ernest Rogers of the Maplewood Animal Hospital. Thank you very much for watching.